everybody is doing well. Today we're here just to sort of discuss a topic that's so often overlooked, whether it comes to policies or just dinner table conversations. So I'm really, I'm really glad. Thank you, Shuffle, for sort of putting this together and um, sort of connecting us with people across the globe to discuss, you know, period poverty and um, the impact of COVID on this issue. And I'm so looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, to begin with, um, I, I think let's just uh, sort of talk about our work and how we've been sort of um, advancing the cause that I'm sure we're so passionate about. Um, yeah, so so uh, Dr. Shatha, would you just like to tell us about all that you've been doing? Okay. So, um... Uh, my, hi, I am Dr. Shraddha and I am the lead trainer at Mina Mina Foundation. So our organization basically works uh, our, uh, to break the taboo around uh, menstrual hygiene. And uh, yeah, the, the, I would just like to introduce a bit about my organization. So uh, the name Mina itself, it's, it's a name of a bird, uh, Mina, it's a chirpy bird. And we and since periods is something that you know women or or the menstruators don't want to talk about. There's a lot of stigma and taboo around the topic, and uh, hence the name is Mina Mahila Foundation. So we want everyone to just go on chirping about uh, periods as well, since it's a natural process, and hence the name of the organization is Mina Mahila Foundation. So being the lead trainer at Mina Mela Foundation, I create content around menstrual hygiene. So it's not just um, menstrual hygiene, but I also address the wider dimensions of it. So uh, gender equality and domestic violence and sexual assault and uh, everything that is related to uh, a woman. Um, so yeah, we kind of create awareness around it. And during the pandemic now, we are trying to go digital and uh, you know do relief work on ground as well right that's, that's amazing. i think coming from india you know up here, i know how big the taboo and the stigma is and yeah i just hope that there's a lot more chirping around this issue um and thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing um laura would you like to tell us about all the amazing work that you have been doing yeah, sounds good. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to meet you as well, everybody as well. Um, so yeah, my name's Laura and I've been working in the UK to end the tampon tax there. So um, I started a petition in 2014 and I didn't think it'd be very popular because obviously it's about periods and taxation, not exactly two very popular topics, especially in 2014. Um, but yeah, to my surprise, it, had, it was quite popular and we ended up getting 320,000 signatures. Um, and the law finally changed just in March this year. Mm. Um, so that was like a real big breakthrough. It took so, so long. And um, yeah, so over the years, we've just seen a real change in attitude towards periods. Obviously, there's a long, long way to go. Um, but the government's also recently launched their new period poverty scheme, thanks to campaigners like Amica George. Um, and so basically, they're giving free period products to all all schools now which is like a huge um piece of progress in the uk uh, so yeah that's me um jane would you like to tell us about the work that you have been doing sure thank you and uh, it's so exciting hearing uh, about what you're all what you've all been doing there's uh, so wonderful you know so many things happening around the world so i've been working in menstrual education one way or another since the mid 80s so for a long time i began uh, working in uh, fertility awareness in with a business called natural fertility management um, and then in 2000 i began running workshops for mothers and daughters called celebration day for girls and i was just started it because i was invited to because of my background with natural fertility management. And uh, it really over, it's, it just built and it took off and it was, uh, it's four girls, uh, 10 to 12 years old, and it's particularly addressing menstrual shame, although we don't use that term with girls because they're, you know, they're not really aware of it. Um, but we found that, you know, and this is this is in Australia, but now it's actually in over 20 countries, and it seems to be really, uh, 
useful for, for many different cultures and we, we encourage uh, facilitators to adapt it as they need to. But mostly they say they don't need to very much uh, because the issues are really the same as, I, as I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, a few years ago, I, be, I started a foundation called the Chalice Foundation, the chalice being a, a symbol of the womb and uh, as, a, as a way to really honour uh, this aspect of our lives and, you know, the lives of, you know, half, half the human population uh, and, and such an important aspect for, for all of us that, as, as you were saying, Dr. Schrader, you know, is, is um, very much w w you know, shrouded in menstrual shame still. And um, really, in my experience around the world, I'll just tell a very little story about one of our trainers who is Peruvian. She lives in Spain uh, and she has run Celebration Day for Girls in Peru and Spain and in Tanzania. And she was telling me one day that uh, what she's found in each place that she's run the workshop the, the women will say, oh, maybe in England women are more comfortable speaking to each other about periods or maybe in Spain. And then in Tanzania, they'll say, oh, maybe in Peru they're more comfortable or maybe in China. Or... And she said, really, wherever she's been, you know, it, it, one way or another, we have, a, we have the taboo and we have shame. And uh, even for women who don't necessarily personally relate to it, as a society, we do. And part of the manifestation of that is, um, uh, you know, the difficulty in talking about it, ignorance about our bodies and about periods and, and the need for taking taxes off menstrual products. <laughs> yeah. Share a little about myself. I'm Anjali. I'm the founder of Full Stop Organization, which is an entirely student-led initiative to sort of break the stigma that surrounds this topic and also improve awareness and access to menstrual products. So our work largely consists of um, going um, to um, underprivileged schools, government schools, and other slum areas where we hold awareness sessions with um, menstruators and, you know, just explain the biology behind periods. And we bust like myths and superstitions that they generally associate periods with. And in addition to that, we also sort of distribute reusable cloth pads to them, you know, as a more long-term and eco-friendly solution. Um, so far, we've held awareness sessions with thousands of girls across India, and we've also helped cover over 75,000 periods. Um, so yes, that's the work that we do. So I'm sure COVID has placed a huge barrier to a lot of people. Um, so Jane, why don't you tell us how COVID has affected menstruators around the world and how it sort of affected your work within this field. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, I, I think in my work particularly, it's probably somewhat less than, you know, for, for the work that the others of you do, uh, are doing. Um, although we, we obviously, uh, no one's running, you know, face-to-face, person-to-person uh, workshops at the moment, uh, but we are running training programs for new facilitators. And we're finding that, uh, although we love to do those in person, <laughs> uh, but it does mean we can have a group, we have a group running at the moment where we've got three women in England, two in Denmark, one in Belgium, one in Italy, um, three in Australia and one in New Zealand, <laughs> um, as well as trainers in a few countries. So, you know, we'd never get these people all together. And uh, we're finding that women who are interested in this work, they're seeing this as the time they can do that training. So we have another one, you know, starting in September. So, you know, while there's a whole lot of things we can't be doing, we're, we're working behind the scenes. And uh, because our work is particularly more focused in um, menstrual education, we're also working with some uh, departments here in Australia to get together some online menstrual education for uh, menstrual educators, for teachers, for health professionals. And as, as you would all appreciate, um, it's so much more than, I mean, the bio biology is really important, but it's so much more than that. You know, we're looking at the emotional aspects. We're, we're looking to understand the shame and what, what are the features of shame resilience based on the work of Brene Brown, which I'm sure you've all come across. 
Um, and we found that, that her model is very useful for us to understand the features of uh, shame resilience, but particularly menstrual shame resilience. But as far as, um, you know, I haven't worked especially with the issues of the pandemic and uh, period poverty. I'm, I'm more secondhand to that in a way. So I'm very interested to hear from all of you what your experience with that is. Amazing, amazing. I'm glad that, you know, you're able to function and do a lot um, despite being sort of confined to your home. And that, that's great to hear. Um, Laura, do you want to... So, um, so, yeah, the pandemic has, of course, affected our work, um, especially being situated in the urban slums of Mumbai. So uh, let, me, let me tell you here that we are located in the red zone. We are in the middle of the red zone. Our organization is right there inside. And we are trying to give all the relief work from there. So yeah, it has affected us in two ways. Uh, one, in terms of, as you know, Laura said that, you know, education and sensitization and everything is affected, of course, because there is a lockdown and we cannot reach out to schools and communities and colleges in terms of education and sensitization. And uh, also in terms of access to the menstrual hygiene products. So Mina has its own uh, sanitary napkins. We have our own sanitary napkins produced and we, we sell them at a very affordable prices uh, at times where we realize that, uh, you know, the menstruator is not um, capable enough to buy it. We have also done a lot of relief work in that case. But now with the pandemic coming on, it's like, uh, the woman has, uh, you know, uh, deprioritized her own health. And that, you know, somewhere uh, in this digital era, we, uh, we kind of lose the personal connect that we should have um, during this um, period, you know, uh, especially with this topic, uh, with menstruation, as Jane said, that, you know, there is a lot of shame associated with it. And, you know, the, the person needs to connect with each other. And when they, when this room full of menstruators, they start sharing their problems, they kind of connect and that's what is missing. And, and that's something, you know, I really feel that I don't know how to overcome this very fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Amazing. I know that periods do not stop with pandemics and then it's so nice to see that none of our work is sort of coming to a halt either. You know, we're just trying to strengthen our efforts. What do you think governments should do to sort of um, improve their crisis response in regard to uh, menstrual hygiene management. Um, Laura, would you would you like to take the lead on this? Yeah, sure. So I think I mean you've all covered this before, but I think you're so right in just that period products should be included in all of the like essential packages that we have. And I don't know about this, your countries, but in the UK, for example, we have um, a chain called Boots, and they're like a pharmacy, basically. Um, and they sell also like makeup and you know, lots of other products to do with that. Um, anyway, so Boots across the countries, they limited their stock to only essential products. Um, but period products did not feature, of course, on this list of essential products. And it is, as you were saying, Dr. Schroeder, about this idea that women are told to put other people mm. first. I think the society as a whole is told to put items that are not specifically women's items first. And like these items that are associated with women are come second to that. And I think that it's just such a shame and it does show like how much more work there is to do. Um, but in terms of governments, I think just being aware of that and putting in place policies to make sure that people don't forget about them um, and guidance even and for example in the UK we have briefings from the Prime Minister every day at the beginning of the pandemic and um, mm. lots of essential items were mentioned by him and his medical team but they never once mentioned periods um, so mm. I mean if they were to have just mentioned periods once and talked about you know people donating to food banks or lots of community organizations for example that were bringing food packages to people um, if they just had mentioned don't forget to donate period products or don't forget to bring period products to people in need um, who may have you know certain medical conditions that means they can't go out and buy them themselves um, that would have been so huge but obviously they didn't do it um, but they may well in the future you never know um, so yeah I think that's what they can do. Okay. Um, Jane would you like to talk about this? Yes yeah, sure um, 
uh, you know, I was so interested to, to hear what you were saying, Laura, and, and I think it's very difficult. You know, there's, uh, I think all the governments, all our governments and governments around the world are, you know, scrambling to, to you know, to use the information they've got about the pandemic and, and you can see them sort of trying to learn on their feet all the time and doing it to varying degrees of, of um, success. Um, so I think, I think that because, you know, menstruation is, is often out of people's mind, as you were saying, Laura, you know, much of the time anyway, it especially falls off. Um, and uh, which is always shocking to me, and I'm sure it is to you, because we know how it, it's just weird. It's actually just weird that, that it's forgotten so much. But I think it's, it's, it's just our, our society's habit of because women, um, you know, uh, are taught to handle it secretly and in isolation, uh, it's not talked about. So in, in our public discourse, men and women and everybody forgets, forgets, forgets to talk about it. Uh, there's sort of this expectation that uh, menstruators will just handle that all secretly and quietly by themselves uh, without realising that it actually can be a, a massive problem. Um, we, if we have in Victoria, we, we have uh, just in the last year have started having free menstrual products for secondary students of what we call public schools and private schools are where parents pay, public schools are state funded. Um, so that has started and, and I actually really just don't know where that's sitting right now. I, I'm, I'm sure they're not sending products to people's homes. Um, we, we had, uh, we had a, uh, a tampon tax, a tampon tax for a long time. And it was, uh, literally because it was, it fell into the luxury <laughs> category rather than the essential category, which again is weird and crazy. Um, but we finally, that finally fell. So last year, all, uh, what we call GST goods and services tax was taken off menstrual products after I think it was 19 years of that. And we worked out that the government would have made uh, around half a billion dollars in that time from taxes from women um, on their menstrual products. So we're, we're um, saying, okay, well, let's have some of that back for menstrual education um, and, and relief of, uh, of period poverty. Just one more thing I'll mention, um, not really not to particularly to do with the pandemic, although it's happened during the pandemic, you might have heard a, of a uh, supermarket chain in New Zealand called Countdown, and they announced a, a week or so ago uh, that they've changed all their language around, yeah, you've heard of it, <laughs> around uh, how they're talking about menstrual products. So they're, they're just calling the pads and tampons and menstrual products and um, intimate products rather than using words like sanitary and, and feminine hygiene and feeling like these words uh, were perhaps uh, in, in, in those instances were more saying there was a problem with menstruation rather than just being very matter of fact about them. So yay, New Zealand. <laughs> right, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it, it's fun using sort of euphemisms, you know, on flow, the time of the month, shock week. But mm -hmm. I think they're so dangerous because they're sort of reiterating the idea that it's not okay to talk about this in public. And it's, it's not okay to sort of just talk about it up front. So yes. Yay, yay New Zealand. <laughs> um, Dr. Shadha, would you, would you want to talk about this? Oh, I think most of it is already answered by Laura and Jane. I don't have anything to add on more to it. It's just that, yeah, um, when it comes to government, I, I somehow see patriarchy interfering everywhere. So even in the government, it's like most of the um, people are male members and very few female and even if you have female members in them uh, like you know it's uh, it's it's really difficult for them to actually have a say even if like you know technically they do have a say but yet they are not listened to like you know and uh, you know your your opinions are not taken into consideration so i think when it comes to the role of government um, if we have more of you know, females on board there and and when the decision will lie in them, they will actually know 
the seriousness of all this. Um, I'm not saying that male, uh, you know, the male members don't know it, but I, I think um, there is still lack of sensitization. So uh, even if they are educated about it, they know why periods occur. They know that it is a natural process. They know that, you know, it's something that a menstruator doesn't choose, but yet there is lack of sensitization in it. So yeah, all of this affects um, how the government works. And On that note, like recently we've seen a lot of um, conversation, especially on social media, about inclusivity in the menstrual justice space and you know how not all menstruators are women and not all women menstruate. And it, it's really important for us to sort of have conversations and move on from women who menstruate to sort of people who menstruate um, so, so how do you think, why do you think this is important and how do you think this can be incorporated in our movement? Um, Jane, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I have to say I haven't had a lot of experience in, in, in this, but I think it's, a, of, to me, it's really obvious that it's incredibly important to be, you know, utterly and totally inclusive um, and to keep learning about how to be and the needs of people that may not uh, identify as women and to make sure that they are included and feel included uh, because everyone who menstruates uh, has, the, has the difficulties of that. And of course, you know, we, we did um, uh, some re research with the Victorian Women's Trust and I think it, it was in my bio that it came out as a publication last year called About Bloody Time, The Menstrual Revolution We Have to Have. And uh, we found it, what, you know, one of the, you know, even working in this field for so long, one of the things that really struck me was the incredible variety of experiences of women. Uh, and in this case, they were, uh, you know, as far as we could tell, all the people who uh, responded to the survey uh, did identify as women. Um, but n still, you know, their experiences are incredibly diverse. And I think uh, even amongst menstruators, we don't often, because it's not so much talked about, we don't often realise, you know, the difficulties that other people are having and, and, and what those difficulties are like. Um, and some who have easy periods may feel like, well, what, why are they complaining? What's the problem? Um, or, or not realizing the difficulties of uh, period poverty. Uh, so I think this is a, another reason why uh, having more and more platforms to be able to share and talk about it and open the conversation really helps us in all ways be sort of empathetic to each other and, and start to look after each other's needs much more. I once did a, a re, just a radio show and it's like relatively small radio podcast. Um, and I talked about people who menstruate, people who buy period products. I mean, people can buy period products even if they don't have periods. So, you know, the tampon tax affects everybody. Um, but even then I got like thousands of people trolling me saying how stupid I am thinking that men can menstruate. And this is some, I'm someone who's, you know, cisgender, like has lots of privileges. So imagine what people who are transgender face, um, who, or who, you know, aren't as privileged as I am. And so it's just, yeah, really, really difficult. Um, but I think really it, it comes from like this misunderstanding of, um, you know, this idea that of course the period shame and period taboo is, completely because of sexism it's a symptom of sexism it's because society associates periods with women and all personal things to do with uh, somehow women's issues are not societal issues and they should be silenced and put in a way in a corner and never never talk about them ever again and somehow they're a symptom of you know a shameful symptom mm -hmm. because being a woman is somehow shameful in some way um so there's like this kind of bring a negativity into the whole activism and the whole revolution and the whole movement that just does not need to be there and it's really really difficult to get over and yeah that's like I don't know how we get over it but hopefully just by talking about it more we will be able to do it. Absolutely absolutely you brought forward so many important points and I absolutely agree how periods like the whole issue of period poverty really sort of blew, um, it has really patriarchal roots. Like in the USA, products such as Rogaine, which is used to like regrow hair for men, that's not taxed because they think that's 
a need, that's a necessity. But period products in so many states are still taxed. Yes, I definitely think, in fact, even toilet paper, the fact that it's generally free in public spaces and period products are not, I think that again has something to do with like the patriarchal roots that society is um, in, in many areas, especially across the world, is sort of built on. Um, even, yeah. sorry, even in Texas, in the USA, um, they have certain items that are not taxed because they're considered to be essential. And like everybody else, other products that are, and period products are taxed because they're considered to be a luxury. But cowboy boots aren't because they're considered to be essential. <laughs> um, and in the UK, it's very similar. You know, period products um, technically are still taxed now as if they're a luxury until the tax goes in January 2021. Um, but other products aren't, and those items include maintaining our private helicopters or eating crocodile meat. Um, you know, these things that everybody does, apparently. <laughs> so, yeah, you're so right. Wow. The tax is another example of it. That, that's so outrageous. That's so outrageous. I think in comparison, India got rid of the um, pink tax in 2016. That is, I think, before a lot of the countries in the world did it. So that's surely something that our country can be proud of. Um, yeah, it, it's outrageous. I I'm not, I can't recall which state, but I know one state in the USA does not tax donuts because that's a necessity. So yeah, I think so many things are absolutely outrageous. In fact, in fact, um, yes, I know many sort of um, um, in in the USA there was one senator who said that period products, you know, we shouldn't give it for free in jails because they aren't clubhouses. And again, I think that just, again, sort of shows us and reiterates how so many people still think that, you know, period products are not a necessity. Yeah. Um, I think sitting in a room full, generally, of like liberals and progressives, like we, many people still think, think a lot of affecting ourselves. I, I, I think we're on the right track. Um, yes, I think, right, for sure, intersectionality does play a huge role. I mean, for instance, young girls who are, um, who are, let's say, at the intersection of gender and age, they're disadvantaged by menstrual injustices that are subject to school girls, let's say, to the indignity of limited bathroom access. And then transgendered men and non-binary persons who are at the intersection of gender and gender identity are disadvantaged by menstrual injustices that um, sort of exclude them from society's policies and practices. And then um, menstruators who are incarcerated, you know, they're disproportionate, especially the disproportionately of color or lower income. They're disadvantaged by menstrual injustices of harassment or coercion when accessing menstrual products. So I don't think that menstrual injustice is merely the, um, the, op the operation of patriarchy or the structural sort of oppression of women, but it's rather the structural intersectionality you know, the overlapping sort of forms of domination, such as patriarchy, white supremacy, um, transphobia, classism, and ableism. For sure, like Laura mentioned, like Jane and Dr. Shadha also mentioned, we need more research about this. We need more conversations. Surely that's, that's really vital when we're talking about this. Um, on that note, I think the last sort of topic or question that we have for you today is what milestones do you think the menstrual hygiene movement has achieved and what do you think is still yet to be achieved? Like, I know there's a lot, but what's the one thing that you really think is needed in this movement? Um, Jean. Oh, that's a, a, a huge question. And um, uh, it's hard for me to think of one thing. What, what, I, what I want to say generally is having, having started in this field, quite possibly before any of you, <laughs> um, is I think for all that we're very aware of what still needs to happen, um, I feel very hopeful because so much is happening and so many, so many of us and so many more around the world are really passionate about making a difference in this space um, and really see the problem. And I, I think, you know, the internet has certainly help it, helped, you know, here we are meeting each other um, and, and being able to communicate. And for a lot of people, even being able to communicate if they, they might be uncomfortable doing that in person to be talking about periods, but if they can do it 
you know, from the privacy of their home, it's helping people, it's helping it to become more open. So I think uh, I, I've certain there's been huge, huge change, you know, let's say in the last 20 years, the last 10 years, the last five years, uh, it's, there's, there's a huge momentum, lots still to do for sure. Um, but uh, it's, it's changing quite rapidly in my view. Absolutely. I, I'm sure you, I mean, from, from what I understand, I think the menstrual movement space is growing at an exponential rate and change is being brought about more faster. And I think this has been long due, but it does, like you mentioned, make a lot of us so hopeful about what the future holds for us in the menstrual movement space and in, in, in the, on the gender equality spectrum in general. Um, Laura, what do you of it? But then slowly, I think with the rapport building process and, you know, normalizing it, I kind of um, bring the ease in the environment during the session. And then they start connecting, especially the boys, they start connecting. And I have seen this when they start connecting it. So it's from one of my personal experience. So uh, my, my grandfather had expired and my mom was uh, at the native place for the rituals there and I had only my brother and me and my sister at home uh, and my brother had missed certain classes uh, because uh, it was during that phase that my grandfather had expired and now he had to learn about this and the topic was menstruation so and then he, he read about it and then he was like uh, oh my god how does this happen and he was actually and he thought that he is reading something different or perceiving it, perceiving it in a different way and then I had just entered my medical field that time. I think I was in my second year or something. And then he thought, I think, um, you know, uh, we call it, elder sisters are called Thai in uh, India. So he, he thought that, you know, I would be the best person to approach and make him understand what this is. And then he came to me. Obviously, at that time, even me being, a, you know, in the medical field and, you know, being raised up in a way that, you know, this, this uh, topic has a lot of shame and stigma around it. Even I was embarrassed, but then somehow my brother, you know, being a, you know, a talker always, I never wanted him to compromise on his marks. And I was like, okay, if this question comes as a long answer or something, and if he loses on it, I, I just don't want that to happen. And then I had to sit and explain the whole biology and how it happens and occurs and everything. And then after explaining everything, there was a kind of two minute silence, complete silence. Even I was like, free, okay, I have done it. I have explained him everything. And then he was completely shocked, absorbing everything inside that this actually happens. And then afterwards, after the two minutes of silence, he's asking me, um, does this happen to you? And I was like, yes. And then he's like, even mom experienced this? And I was like, yes. And then he's asking, okay, even Ankita, my uh, younger sister, does she also experience this? And then I was like, yes, we all do. And that very moment, after that, the moment he has seen us on bed, it may be due to period cramp or not, or due to any other reason, he used to be so afraid. And he's like, oh, is it paining? Should I get you a hot water bottle? Uh, can I help you in some ways? Do you want me to, you know... Uh, help you you know uh, get up or you know do this or that what, what do you want to eat and everything and 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 that particular moment it made me realize that it's just that they don't know about it once they connect it with their own family members it's not that they don't love us they do love us uh, you know it's just that they don't experience it how on earth do you want or do you expect them to understand something that they don't experience until and unless you yourself sit and explain it to them that's when this you know i realized that you know uh, that it's it's us that we are not openly speaking about it and if we do the opposite person is going to know what it is and why does that happen and you know relate with it in different ways maybe so yeah, but when it comes to schools and colleges, sorry, I just go out and do different things. So yeah, uh, so in schools and colleges, uh, similar fashion, I had one, uh, so at the end of the session, I give my phone number and tell them that, you know, you okay, you can contact me for any 
any reasons uh, in that case. So I just got a call once and then um, the, the girl was like, I am so thankful to Maina Maila. Uh, and then I was like, okay, thanks to you. you uh, and you know, we, we are really uh, thankful that you loved our session and everything. And she's like, no, 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 I did not attend your session. So and I'm like, then, then what? Then she's like, oh, my younger brother attended it. And you know, during the session, we give one uh, sanitary pad packet free of course to each and every um, participant of the session. So during the session, I see to it that even boys take the pad packets in their hand. So usually it's like at first they don't want to handle it. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to even, they are, they are so scared. I don't know whether they are scared or they're embarrassed, but they are like, they just put the bag in front of me and they're like, just drop it in. Uh, and some of them just kind of run away. So, and you know, knowing all these scenarios, I tell the, you know, I pre inform the coordinator that, okay, you have to shut the classroom doors because I don't want anyone to run away. And I want them to handle the pack packet and everything. So, and then I tell them that, you know, maybe this pack packet is um, important. Uh, it uh, might be of some use for your mother or your sister or your friends for that matter. Uh, so you need to handle it kind of and you know obviously my main motto behind it is breaking the seed to all this sensitization and critical thinking and young generation definitely is going to play a big role I do look up at young generation as big you know change makers when it comes to this they are so you know they just have they are so ready to accept things and not rigid about Absolutely. And I